it is one. So it is one of those days, and uh, uh, anniversaries, I think, where we all know where we were at the time. Uh, you know, uh, Willie Lewis, where were you? <laughs> Just as you're eat, trying to eat. Finley Lewis, where were you? I was uh, preserving freedom in uh, South Korea. Of course you were. <laughs> of course you were. I was, in, I was in the United States Army, and I was actually a Korean linguist who was working directly, or more or less directly, for an obscure agency that some of you may have heard of, the National Security Agency. Ah, yes. No such agency. Um, well, I, I was a boy reporter at the time at the uh, New York Herald Tribune. And I remember being in the city room and uh, seeing the senior editors clustered around a UPI wire machine, spitting out this news from Dallas. And so as a very junior reporter, I was sent out into the street to uh, get man on the street reaction. So I went over to uh, Fifth Avenue in front of the New York Public Library and um, talked to people as they went by about their reaction. And it wasn't uniformly uh, supportive of President Kennedy. It's, it's worth remembering that he was not, he, he was a greatly, I think, loved and respected figure today. He, it was not universal then. So, uh, some were very upset and very, very supportive of him, and others were uh, inclined to say almost good riddance. Uh, so he was, he was a polarizing figure, uh, as presidents have been since. Um, Jim Reston, Jr. says in the uh, introduction to the book that uh, you were a young aide to Stuart Udall at the time. And you mention, and it's repeated in the, in the post today, uh, in Al Kamen's column, that Stuart Udall and half the, um, half the cabinet were on that airplane flying uh, to Japan to a meeting, including Dean Rusk, Secretary of State, and others. And they, they were going, and they got the word. And, and uh, uh, Al describes in his column today how Dean Rusk was brought up to the cockpit, I gather, to get the information uh, about it. And then once they learned that it uh, had been a fatal wound, they turned the plane around. Right. And the cabinet, uh, or those members of the cabinet, made a return. Right. But anyway, today, um, James Reston, Jr. has written an intriguing with an intriguing theory. He says in the, in the introduction that this, his book uh, is profoundly anti-conspiracy. This is not a conspiracy book. It is a profoundly uh, pro-theory book. He's got an idea here and a, an explanation. And um, I think you ought to start by telling us the, what that is, the central thesis of the accidental victim. Sure. Uh, well, this book really has several um, major impulses of why, uh, why I decided a year and a half to, to, to do this. I had written a biography of John Connolly of, of Texas that was published in 1989. And along the way, of course, I had had to uh, focus on the Dallas assassination. It is such a fascinating story with so many levels and so many questions to it that I literally got lost in the whole thing for, uh, for two or three months. I'd been commissioned to write a biography of the whole political life of Connolly, and I had to just kind of stop and move on. Uh, but. Uh, in the course of that research, I felt that uh, I came upon 
some very interesting new um, uh, information that would change the way we th think about the Dallas assassination. And I, I would say that um, historians generally, sometimes when you attack a historical event from an, ob from an oblique angle, sometimes some very interesting new insights can, uh, can develop. And yet I felt it, that it was kind of unfinished business in that, uh, in that uh, work. So uh, on I went. The other impulse was that a year and a half ago, I uh, was interviewed by the History Channel uh, for one of their, uh, their special on November the 22nd. And in the course of that, the, the, the producer told me that they had conducted a poll suggesting that 85% of the American people believe there was a conspiracy to kill Kennedy. This incensed me because I knew from my own research that there was absolutely no compelling evidence whatsoever that there was a conspiracy behind, um, be, behind the assassination. And so if you um, would go with me uh, that far, and we can certainly um, uh, backtrack into why I, I feel that way, if you shove aside the uh, absurd uh, conspiracy theories, LBJ did it, or the Cubans did it, or Russia did it, or uh, who else? I mean, uh, CIA. The, the CIA it did If you put that aside, it leaves you with the mindset of Lee Harvey Oswald. And it has always fascinated me um, as someone who, who was involved in protests and complaints about public policy all my life, how any individual would move beyond the level of complaint or protest into the level of violence. What, what uh, impels somebody to actually pick up a weapon and try to kill somebody, much less kill a major political political figure. So, um, uh, what the Warren Commission had argued was that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald had uh, had done this act because he was a Marxist. Well, there are millions of Marxists. They're not all pathological killers. Okay, they said, well, maybe he had grandiose notions. Well, we all have grandiose notions, <laughs> right? I've got grandiose notions. You know? And lastly, they say, oh, well, he wanted to be a figure of history. Well, it's hard for me to imagine <coughs> exactly 50 years ago in the morning hours of November the 22nd that um, Lee Harvey Oswald woke up and he said, oh, I think I'll be a figure of history today. You know? or, B, I think I'll go kill the president because I'm a Marxist or because I have grandiose notions. Generally speaking, I am a huge uh, fan of the Warren Commission. It is the grandest, most exquisite uh, investigation in American history. But it has this one major flaw that it did not, beyond saying that Oswald did it himself, the explanations that they give for why Oswald did it are very transparent and unsatisfying and unsatisfactory. And in my view, that opened up itself, the floodgates, to other people speculating on why, uh, why Oswald did that. So uh, partly because I've also written novels um, and always been concerned with what makes people tick, um, I wanted to get into the question of uh, what would have motivated the rage and fury of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. And Let me ask you uh, on that point. Yes. Whether you feel, you say the Warren Commission you know, was reluctant to go into that. Uh, why? Well, I think, um, I, I think there was a political aspect to the Warren Commission in the sense of what could they, in the end, sell to the American people about why the great question always in history, the why of this, this thing, that 
if they had uh, taken seriously, which they did not, the testimony of Marina Oswald, who said that uh, Connolly was the target, not Kennedy, uh, or if they'd taken seriously the testimony of the Russian emigres in Dallas, uh, who also testified uh, on this question, you put together the attitude of Oswald towards Kennedy and towards Connolly. And the attitude towards Kennedy was one of universal admiration. Uh, Marina Oswald testifies to this, that, Marina Os uh, that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and Marina Oswald followed the uh, presidency of, of Kennedy through 62 and 63 with, uh, with agreement and, uh, and indeed an element of admiration. Oswald himself was deeply against the racists uh, and racism of the uh, American South. He um, had, uh, you know, President Kennedy in 1963 was engaged in, the, in negotiating the nuclear test ban treaty with Russia, which, um, which he would have uh, subscribed to. Um, he, uh, Kennedy was engaged in a softer policy towards uh, Cuba, which, uh, which Oswald would have agreed with. And then on the personal level, uh, remember Jackie Kennedy had, was pregnant in, in 1963. Marina Oswald was also pre pregnant with their second child. And the Oswalds together followed the pregnancy of Jackie Kennedy, um, the tragic uh, pregnancy of, J of Jackie Kennedy with great <coughs> fascination and identification. So that's the Kennedy side of the thing. So where's the rage? Where's the, you know, where's the fury to pick up the weapon that morning to kill somebody that he admired? A major question. What about his attitude so far as it can be established towards John Conway? Now, that's the essence of this whole thing. That uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, as you know, went to Russia immediately after being discharged from the U.S. Marine Corps, honorably. And for some cockamamie reason, decided he wanted to defect to the Soviet Union. Technically, he does not defect, uh, and that becomes important later as he tries to come back into the United States. But at any rate, he moves to Minsk. And he uh, acquires a wife, and she becomes pregnant, and, and uh, so he has a family. Uh, at the beginning, he's treated as kind of a hero of the Soviet Union. He had chosen the Soviet Union over uh, the, uh, the United States, and he was given a stipend as, uh, to, as a kind of reward for his choice. Well. As they move through this year and a half in the uh, Soviet Union, the Soviets and the people in the, the radio factory where he worked came to know who this character was, and they remove his stipend. They, he's no longer a hero of, of the Soviet Union. And it's at that point that he decides, well, maybe the Soviet Union is not everything it's cracked up to be, and maybe I think I will go home. It's at that very moment uh, in February, January, February of 1962, that he lear learns that his discharge from the Marine Corps has been summarily changed from honorable to dishonorable. This, he knows instinctively, is a massive blow to him uh, because uh, he knows that with a ninth grade education, and the bad paper of a dishonorable discharge, how is he going to support his family when he goes back to the United States? And so he determines that the person to write about this is the Secretary of the Navy in, in Washington, because as you know, the Navy Department has sway over the US Marine Corps. And he sits down and he writes a plaintive, heartfelt letter to uh, the Secretary of the Navy, who he knows is from Texas, and indeed, like himself, uh, from Fort Worth. Um, three weeks later, he gets a response to this. 
I'm no longer Secretary of the Navy. Here's my successor's name, sincerely yours. And it comes to Lee Harvey Oswald in Minsk in a letter in which is emblazoned on the front, John Connolly for governor of Texas, with a picture of Connolly's head in the middle of a Texas star. Um, I believe, and do argue in this book, that, that that's the catalyst. That becomes the beginning of his frustrations. And in other words, he brushes him off. Total bureaucratic. He brush, brushes him brushes off. Brushes off in this incendiary package that comes with this kind of derisive smiley face uh, about this politician running, running for office. Now, the next year and a half, as we used to say in the theater, the through line of Oswald's life is to try to change this discharge with a number of other uh, appeals to, uh, to From other... From dishonorable to, to honorable. To, Yes, so that because when he comes back, and this is also deep within the, in the Warren Commission documents from the emigres in Dallas that knew him, that when he would go for employment in Texas, um, they would say, well, what have you done? How much education? Well, I had a ninth grade education. What else have you done in your life? I was in the US Marine Corps. You were discharged honorably, right? And he would freeze. So this, this became a quest for him to remove, uh, remove this Damocles sword that was, uh, was over him. And I believe it was always personalized in the, in the, uh, in the face of John Connolly. But John Connolly is no longer the Secretary of the Navy. He can yes. no longer help him. That's right. Yeah. And so? Why the continued fixation then on a man who can no longer solve your problem? Um, well, I think it's uh, symbolic. That's the one. That's the one face that he knows. Mm -hmm. The rest of it is uh, faceless. He certainly, um, you know, takes account of John Connolly as a governor, but. Uh, there is one figure in Accidental Victim that is very important, and that's somebody by the name of George de Morinschild, mm -hmm. who was a very elegant uh, Polish emigre living in Dallas. And he picks up uh, Oswald as a figure of interest and rather toys with him, I think. So, um, you know, you, he becomes the best source for any kind of political discussion that uh, that uh, for, for political discussions that they had and what, what, what uh, Oswald's politics were. And it is just absolutely clear in that narrative from de Morangeld that whenever Conley comes up, he has a very deep and obsessive dislike for, for John Conley. How many of the characters in this book, like more, um, uh, any of them, uh, were you able or have you been able to meet and interview in the, in the years? Said like a good journalist, right? As if only those that you interview are the sources for No, no, uh, there are others. The, Warren, uh, the, the uh, uh, fair point, the, um, the Warren Commission, obviously, there's great testimony in there. Well, that I know you've seen. But Yes. I'm curious how many of these people, the, the major players in this, you've been able to uh, interview or contact. Well, um, John Conley himself uh, would not talk to me unless we had a financial arrangement. And uh, I told him right at the beginning that I w there would be no financial arrangement between us. And as a result of that, he did everything possible to undermine my biography of him. But um, uh, I was able to talk to a number of people. They're, um, they're in the back. Uh, the one, I suppose, that is most critical to, the, um, to the, the two major theories that are in this book is Senator Ralph Yarbrough, mm -hmm. uh, who was the liberal senator from Texas. Uh, I uh, relate in exquisite detail the 
um, the back and forth between the White House and the, uh, and the governor's office about the nature of the, uh, of the trip, the build up to the trip to, uh, to Dallas. And it's not a positive tale about politicians. It's really uh, full of grudges and resentments and pettiness and, and uh, so forth. But Yarborough said one thing to me at the beginning of our interchange, and he said, that damned girdle. Now, I didn't know what he was talking about. Girdle. The damned girdle, he said. Yeah. Corset, girdle. <laughs> right. And it was, um, it was that brief interchange on that particular subject with Yar Yarborough that led me to look into the whole question of the corset that LBJ was, uh, LBJ, that JFK, that JFK was, uh, was wearing on November the 22nd. So You might explain at, that back yeah, brace right, and what it yeah, was and what role it played. Right. Is Alexandra in the audience here? Right. Hi, Alexandra. Alexandra Zapruder is in the audience, the, grand, Ooh, uh, the, the granddaughter of um, Abraham Zapruder, who is working on a very interesting book about the Zapruder film. The Zapruder film is the essential uh, piece of evidence uh, about what happened um, as the car comes down Main Street and then in front of the uh, book depository. And um, the, uh, there are, ladies and gentlemen, only two shots, not three. Don't believe what you hear at the, uh, the museum. Don't believe those reporters who said three shots rang out in Dealey Plaza. There were only two. Um, and the first one passes through the neck of, of Kennedy and through the back of, uh, of John Connolly going through his body completely, hitting his wrist and lodging in his thigh. That is the so-called magic bullet. Um, so um, that, that bullet strikes while the view of Zapruder's camera is blocked by a, a road sign. So we don't see that bullet hit, but as the as the uh, car emerges from that sign in the Zapruder film, you see Connolly begin to writhe f and flail to one side and to the other, and then ultimately to either be pulled or, f or, f or falls into his wife Nellie's lap. Um, Kennedy's body language comes, his, his, uh, his hand comes to his neck, but in the next five section, seconds, and if you count them, it seems like an eternity, all that happens in the body is that the, that the head goes forward like this, okay? But the torso remains fixed in place, almost as if he is bolted to the back of the seat, of the presidential seat. And if you work this out mathematically from the first bullet at frame 230 in the Zapruder film to the killing shot in three, at 313, the Kennedy uh, remains bolted upright and is the only target five seconds later that remains for the second shot. Okay, why did that happen? It happened because he was wearing a back brace. Now, um, I'm the only writer, I believe, that's seen the back brace. Uh, I went to see it in uh, February at the National Archives. Had to go to extraordinary lengths to let them uh, actually s s let me see the actual artifact because, as you well know, um, there's so much voyeurism around the Kennedy assassination that uh, they are appropriately uh, very protective of something like the actual back brace he was wearing that day or the shirt or the tie or whatever, M much less Jackie's uh, dress, bloodstained dress. But, but um, I did view this uh, back brace. It's, um, it has shoelaces 
that you winch together very tightly. And once the shoelaces are winched together tightly, there are three belts that uh, tighten it even further. And on the date of November the 22nd, uh, that back brace was further tightened around his waist with an ace bandage that went all the way around the back brace several times and then was, uh, went in a figure eight through his legs. So you could scarcely understand. A <coughs> photograph of this uh, back brace in the book. Uh, and on a subsequent page, there's a photograph of you viewing it uh, out at the uh, archives. Right. Place. So you could scarcely uh, understand how the man could have walked in this con contraption. Uh, the point of it was, from his standpoint, a point of vanity, that he was projecting to the world uh, athletic military posture. And because his back was so flawed, uh, technically it was, um, uh, he needed this, uh, this uh, back brace. So I'm arguing, in effect, he was almost mummified into, uh, into, into position. And it was uh, Ralph Yarbrough who And it was Ralph Yarbrough who got, got me onto this. Now, I have talked to Iraq uh, combat veterans about what would happen if someone was, was wounded through the neck? And they say, we're all with one voice, of course you would flail all over the place in terrible pain. And, and yet, in those five seconds, the body was basically stationary. So, an accidental victim. Uh, in, and that's part of the accident. Yes. Right. Yes, but there are lots of accidents in this tale. It really is... Again, if you shove aside the conspiracy theories, it is a, a story of spontaneity, of randomness, of cruel fate. And I found um, interesting and persuasive the testimony of other people that you cite in the book, from Marina Oswald to his, uh, the other Soviet emigres in, uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, uh, to his, uh, his obsessive uh, hate, if that's the right word, of John Connolly, his, his fixation right. is a better word, on John Connolly and, um, and their belief and her testimony that he was the target. Now, I gather from you in a conversation that, that she has drifted away from that. Yes, well... She's uh, still uh, alive, incidentally. Uh, 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 right? Yeah, again, just to bait you a little bit, uh, Terry, that, that uh, one tease. could go, uh, tease, tease, not bait. The, um, if one were to go to, to speak to Marina Aswell today, I think you would get nothing of value. But what is important is what she testified to under oath immediately uh, after the event from a historical standpoint, right. under oath to the Warren Commission and later in 1977 to the House Assassinations Committee where she repeated that Connolly was the target. These and she were said testimonies, it quite flatly. Testimonies under, under oath, and she was also asked, of course, about their attitude towards Kennedy, and the attitude was one of, of um, universal support. So, to me, that's, that's an interesting, and, and um, I did not know that, and it, it draws out. Um, Lucky Marmon, you want to say something on that? Why was that ignored in most of the uh, Oh, here's a, here's a microphone. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, Jim, why was the, uh, that uh, ignored in so much of the... Why was what? The Marine the, the, Oswald? The Marine Oswald testimony. I mean, I thought I knew it was fairly up, but I didn't know about that. Well, you know, the, well, this is left to one's own... Um, analysis of the thing. Um, here was this most horrendous crime, or w one of the two or three most horrendous crimes in American history. Um, could the Warren Commission, after the most grandiose uh, investigation in all of American history, ended up telling the American people that their president was killed accidentally? 
I think that was politically impossible for them to say. And what is quite extraordinary about reading the testimony of, of, uh, of Marina Oswald on this point to both the Warren Commission and the House Assassinations Committee is that the interrogators, the congressional interrogators, almost say, what? You're saying, what? Really? You know, I mean, she, they almost kind of browbeat her. Say, Is that your testimony? Uh, and then immediately move on to something else. It's absolutely extraordinary, the, the, um, uh, the way in which they fail to follow up on this critical testimony from the most uh, critical witness in the whole thing. What about the House Select Committee on Assassinations that went into all of this again in 1978? Again, a, a kind of brief <laughs> interrogation in which he says, I testified to this under oath to, to the Warren Commission, and I, uh, I stand by my, uh, by my testimony. And they, says it's kind of, um, really, OK, and then they move on to some other uh, issue. So they don't pursue it any further. You have a question on this point? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Weston, uh, I'm Phil Webster from the Aspen Y Fellows. And uh, in every state I've ever lived, the governor is very visible, very approachable, has very little security, even up to today's date. Why would I select Dallas, Texas at a nationally and internationally secured event and take a shot from such a distance when in days earlier or months earlier I could approach the governor of Texas and take him out much easier? Well, uh, maybe you could if you had the money to run all over the state of Texas to do that. Um, and, um, you know, maybe you could if the, if the governor's itinerary was, was clearly uh, uh, publicized for somebody with a ninth grade education that they would know where to go. If you read Accidental Victim, you'll see that Lee Harvey Oswald did stalk Connolly twice. Once he went to the governor's office in Austin and announced that he wanted to see the governor. And he was turned, turned aside to this. This is very well remembered by the woman who, who uh, turned, in, turned him aside. More importantly is a time when indeed Connolly does come to Dallas. And um, uh, he, uh, in his apartment, goes and gets his uh, sidearm. And he starts out the door. And somehow or another, M Marina, knowing how dangerous he has become, locks him in a bathroom. And they have this furious uh, shouting match with one another through the, this locked door uh, that goes on and on for a very considerable amount of time until she feels she has brought him down enough uh, emotionally that she can unlock the door and let him out. Um, so. Um, th those are two points. Beyond that, this is a character who had uh, two nickels to rub together. He can't be running all over the, the state to try to uh, accomplish this, uh, this sort of thing. And um, then you have this awful serendipity, if that's the word, from his standpoint, of the fact that as the fates had it, this car was going to go right under his window. So you put all of the, the Texas book depository. At the, Where he had just the, gone to work a few weeks. Uh, at before. the Texas uh, <coughs> book depository. And I think you know, all of the, that emotional roiling and fury um, came to bear that, uh, th that mo moment. Now, there is an analysis, lots of questions. We will get to them. The, uh, there is an analysis uh, or discussion in the book of another so-called conspiracy theory, which relates to the question of whether Jack Ruby uh, in any way hired uh, Lee Harvey Oswald to shoot uh, John Connolly. And uh, you might talk about that briefly on the, the Jarnigan. Is that the way you would yes, say the name? Right. Jarnigan. Yeah. 
uh, notes of a conversation allegedly between Ruby and Oswald yes. shortly before. Explain that. Uh, to begin with that, that chapter, I almost feel a little apolog apologetic about it because it's, it's one of those things where a historian uh, who is a storyteller, which is essentially the way I view myself, comes upon a very extensive dialogue um, that is rather riveting. And there is this extensive dialogue that, um, that is ostensibly between Jack Ruby and Lee Harvey Oswald that's overheard by, an, by a, um, a lawyer in, in Dallas by the name of Carol Jar Jarnigan. I put that whole dialogue in there because uh, I know, having taught creative writing for 10 years, that whenever you find an extensive dialogue, that's where people get really interested to see how issues are joined with one another. But I, in the end, what I point out is that Carol Jarnigan was a drunk. And uh, drunk at the time. And drunk, drunk at, at the time. And I put this out as a way in which conspiracy theories can, uh, can develop and the way in which people tried to sort of enter into the whole Kennedy assassination thing for personal reasons to sort of uh, make themselves uh, significant in, in some way You should explain that the notion is that the Jarnigan and a, and a date are at Jack Ruby's strip club right. and allegedly he hears a conversation between Jack Ruby and uh, Manny believes is Lee Harvey Oswald at a, a next door table in which it seems that Jack Ruby is hiring uh, this person, Oswald, to kill John Connolly, uh, allegedly because Connolly was uh, an obstacle to the mob being more successful right. in Texas right. at this time. Right. So, and and, and they, so this whole thing is laid out. Uh, <laughs> in um, and at the end of the chapter, it's, uh, it's stated accurately that he is given a lie detector test uh, multiple times, and he fails it every single time. So. Jarnigan does, yes, and yes. he fails it every time. Anyway, lots of questions. Yes, sir. From what I understand, in order for the Warren Commission report to be taken uh, credibly, Lee Harvey Oswald had to be a good shot. And is he, in your view, and if so, why would that second shot be aimed at the president as opposed to the position in the car where Connolly, his intended victim, was? Uh, this uh, subject always comes up. Um, I, uh, I would say he's an excellent shot. Um, if that first bullet had been several millimeters to the left it would have hit the president's spinal cord and killed him, the first shot. If that same bullet had been a few millimeters the other way as it coursed into Connolly's back, uh, it would have hit his heart. And so it, just in the accidents of the forensics in all of this, that first bullet, bullet could have killed them both. Um, but it, uh, it, doesn't kill, uh, it doesn't kill them both. What you, um, what you have to understand, and this becomes so clear when you go to Dealey Plaza, is that the sniper's nest is way up here on the sixth floor. And the car comes down Main Street of, of Dallas, has to slow almost to a stop to take a right onto a street called Houston Street, and then go one block and at the corner of the uh, of the book depository, take a slow left, and go down Elm Street. Well, there is today, and there was then, a significant tree in front of uh, the book depository. And so if you think about this in terms of the line of sight of Lee Harvey Oswald, he had to wait for the car to, to uh, clear the tree. Uh, at that point, the uh, car is going down Elm Street, and he's looking at the back of the car, and the two bodies are basically aligned. Mm -hmm. There's almost you know, an inch or two one way that you could see Conley as opposed to, to the president. 
So um, if you want to get into who, whether he's a good shot or a bad shot, I saw, and he was going after Conley, he would have had to have cited that one inch where he could see Conley's shoulder or something or another. You also address the question in the book of, of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's potential to be an assassin, to kill someone. Not, I don't think every one of us has that in us. And, and that related to his attempt, previous attempt, in which a shot was actually fired at General Edwin Walker. Yes. Talk about that. Explain. That. Well, um, let me preface that by saying that if you really want to consider this whole question, you really ought to watch a movie called The Day of the Jackal. Uh, because The Day of the Jackal is uh, one of the great films of all time, in my view. Um, shows you what a professional assassin needs to go through if he's out to kill a head of state. And there are months and months that are involved in the planning and the, it's very dramatic in that film the way in which the weapon, the special weapon is made and the special ammunition is made. Lee Harvey Oswald paid $19.95 to buy a mail order rifle in March of 1963. Uh, the lowest possible kind of, uh, of weapon that one can buy. And the ammunition that he had for that is also of the lowest possible uh, quality. So that, that becomes a point, point number one if he had been the tool, the patsy, the, uh, the agent of either a criminal organization or a uh, foreign government, they would have given him the very best weapon and the very best ammunition that, uh, that he could possibly have. Well, Lee Harvey Oswald, through all of his frustrations, I mean, he's really now cursed with his lack of education and now his bad discharge. And his, uh, and his uh, marriage has fallen apart, and he's become a wife beater, and is full of terrible frustrations. So at this point in March of 1963, he becomes a very dangerous man. Uh, and not long after, he uh, acquires this uh, low-grade rifle with a telescopy sight. He goes crawling behind the, uh, the uh, house of General Edwin Walker in Dallas and takes a shot uh, at him uh, at night. Now, Edwin Walker, Walker is a right-wing figure at this point. Right? Is a right-wing nut. Um, and he has been cashiered out of the military uh, because he has uh, publicly claimed that uh, Terry Truman was a pinko. Okay? And once having been so cashiered out, uh, he gets very involved in the, um, in the integration segregation movement in the South goes to Oxford, Mississippi, and gets, uh, becomes part of the protest against James Meredith being admitted into old, old Miss, and is arrested for, uh, for uh, disorderly <coughs> conduct. This is a very bad guy. Uh, but he uh, is also a publicity hound. And uh, he finds himself on the cover of Newsweek magazine as a sort of the figure of the radical right in, in America during, uh, during this, uh, this period. So, um, uh, so Oswald takes a uh, shot at him. It misses Walker by just a matter of inches. And what is really significant about this, I think, is, well, Obviously, it's significant that this, we now have a very dangerous character in, in our midst in Oswald. But what is further significant is that the FBI and the Dallas Police Department conclude that uh, General Walker had staged this thing as a publicity stunt. And they fail to investigate the, uh, the matter. So this becomes one of those accidents along the way that could have changed history had uh, the Dallas uh, police and the FBI apprehended Lee Harvey Oswald for that act. And of course, in Oswald's mind, he has gotten away with it. 
Yes. He has gotten away with an attempted assassination. Well, you might try again. Yes, sir. Do we have a microphone? Uh, right there. Incidentally, the picture of the famous picture that you've all seen is on the back of the book here of Oswald holding that rifle. Uh, and what's he got there? A newspaper or something rolled up? The militant. Oh, the militant. All right. Okay. Go ahead, sir. You mentioned that after the first shot. Uh, can't hear you. The power, okay, there. there you, you mentioned that after the first shot, uh, Governor Connolly was sprawled across the seat in his wife's lap, and that the only visible target was Kennedy himself. Uh, you also said that Oswald admired Kennedy. Why then do you think he took the second shot at Kennedy? Mm. Yes, um, I have question. to defer in this kind of a thing to the psychiatrist, and there is a famous psychiatrist in our midst with whom I have talked uh, about this at uh, great length, but I've talked to other psychiatrists also. Um, there is in psychiatry something called a motor program. And a motor program means, if I state this correctly, Dr. Restack, that when one is in a um, state of the highest uh, excitement, and has decided to uh, do something so horrendous as to uh, shoot political figures, that once the process begins, you almost can't stop. And you're only talking about five seconds here. So that the, the, uh, the repetitive motion becomes critical. Secondly, uh, you need to look at the um, Marine Corps hand-to-hand -hand combat manual. Uh, and remember that Lee Harvey Oswald was trained in the Marine Corps. Uh, and the, in the Marine Corps hand-to-hand -hand combat manual, it is very clear that you are trained to keep shooting until you kill your enemy ahead of you. So that, I think, is in the psychology of it. And thirdly, if you talk to hunters who have who are in a state of high excitement with huge trendly going. It's very hard to stop when you have started to, uh, to, uh, to shoot. So that if um, you were to be correct that, that uh, he should have stopped because his target was no longer available, that would require a, a huge intellectual effort to stop and make an intellectual judgment in those five seconds that, to stop shooting. That's the argument. I must say it's amazing to me that since this is a moving vehicle going along at whatever speed, um, that, that a second shot you know, could strike the target or a target. Remember, he has to shoot, he has to reload, and he That's has to amazing. aim again all in five seconds and with a, a uh, car going away. Okay, uh, yes, please. Uh, Hi, Jim. Explain who you are. Oh, I'm, I'm Alexander Zapruder. Right. It's not of any importance today. Alexander Zapruder, if you could hear. Hi. Your granddaughter, <laughs> is that correct? Correct, yes. Um, I wanted to ask you, Jim, if there's, if you think there's anything in the way that Oswald conducted himself in that night and when he was being interviewed by the media, that sort of chaotic scene that we see, um, that supports this in terms of his demeanor or what he, anything that he said that supports the idea that he was aiming for Connolly and got the president by accident. I'm curious if you can talk about that. Yes. No. There's no. There's nothing in in uh, in the police records to to indicate that. Um, as some of you know, I did a, a I published a piece on Monday in Slate magazine uh, 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 at, about a tour that I had made of Oswald sites in Dallas in in, um, in September, and um, you know he um, he just walks out of the book depository and um, ultimately takes a cab to his residence and, um, and uh, picks up his sidearm and a coat and starts walking. Uh, I think that 
in the mile and a half or two miles where Oswald is walking after he has killed the president and wounded Connolly, that that is when he tried to get his story together uh, because he could well anticipate that he would be apprehended eventually. Uh, my tour guide that day was a guy by the name of uh, Darwin Payne, who was the Dallas uh, Times Herald reporter, uh, or one of them, on uh, November the 22nd. And uh, so we had a lot of discussion about this. And what, what Darwin said uh, from many interviews with police officers who had been part of the interrogation of Oswald in the police station in the two days of his life before he's killed, was how tough he was, that he gave nothing. He, he, was, he was acerbic, he was, he was uh, aggressive, he said all kinds of crazy things. They couldn't get him to uh, admit anything uh, about having done, done anything, that he was the wrong, wrong person and so forth. So I don't think we, we consign any importance whatever to what Oswald said in those, in those last two, two days of his life. What motivated, in your opinion, Jack Ruby to shoot Lee Harvey Oswald? What was it, three days? Uh, two or three days later. Yes. Well, um, uh, I have to storyteller, right? I mean, I have to tell you a story before that that came out of the, uh, the tour of the Dallas uh, sites. We started at the Dallas police station in, um, in Dallas in September. And uh, right up the street is the, West, the old Western Union office there. And on the morning of November the 24th, um, mm -hmm. Ruby uh, decides to go downtown. Now, Darwin That's Payne, Sunday, right? Darwin, Darwin Payne says, says Ruby only loved two things in his life, his strippers and his little dog, Sheba. And so he <laughs> piles little Sheba in the car and goes down downtown to the Western Union office to wire money to one of his hard-pressed strippers. Okay, And then he comes out of that building and walks only 50 uh, yards or so down Main Street there to the Dallas police headquarters and walks down an automobile ramp into the basement of the police headquarters where there is a huge throng of, uh, of, um, of police officers and reporters waiting for Oswald to emerge uh, because Oswald needs to be transferred from the city jail to the, uh, to the county jail. So Ruby walks down, finds himself on the periphery of this of this crowd at the very moment that Oswald emerges in a far door um, and moves a few steps forward, Ruby pushes his way through the throng, pulls out his weapon, and shoots him. Okay. So Ruby so, is packing, first of all. He's what? He's packing on this <laughs> Sunday morning. Weren't they all? Intense? Weren't they all? All right. <laughs> How silly of me. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. Um, now, the question was about why would he do it? Um, all we have is what Ruby testified to in his trial. Uh, he gave two explanations for why he did it. The first is that as a Jew, his real name was Rubenstein, he wished to be aggressive and brave, to show the world that Jews, this is before the 1967 Six Day War, uh, when the, you know, this thing about the Holocaust was still in the air about Jews being docile in relation to the Holocaust. He wanted to show that a Jew could be, could be aggressive and take things into his, his own hands. That was his first thing. His second uh, explanation was that he was trying to relieve Jackie Kennedy yeah. of the suffering that would come uh, in the trial for her in the trial of her husband's assassin and maybe even be called as a witness to that trial that he was doing this noble act uh, to Jackie Kennedy to remove uh, her suffering over the whole thing do we believe these uh, explanations 
it sounds very much like what a lawyer would uh, put in a, a client's uh, mind in, you know, Jack, they're going to ask you why you did this. Why don't you come up with, what about this? What about that? Not a very good lawyer, uh, <laughs> I would say. So, uh, so that's all we know. Now, this uh, reporter, Darwin Payne, told me that uh, Ruby did have a press conference a month or so after he had killed Oswald. And you could scarcely uh, understand a word he said. He was, dis he was, he was delusional. He was, uh, he was all over the place. He could scarcely put one, um, uh, one uh, word uh, after another. And what happens ultimately to Ruby, it's the sort of the final twist in the story, is that he is jailed. He's convicted and jailed. And he's incarcerated in a cell that overlooks Dealey Plaza. And he dies four years later looking over Dealey I mean, Plaza. In, in theory, if you accepted the notion that Jack Ruby had hired Lear, uh, Harvey Oswald to kill uh, John Connolly, uh, you could imagine that he wanted to eliminate Oswald lest he testify to that effect. But if you don't accept the first, you can't accept the second. That's right. uh, uh, Willie Lewis has a question about the pet lover in us uh, yes. in the audience right. here. What happened to the dog? Yes, so I think Jim has told us at one point that he did make the uh, premeditated uh, attempt to give Sheba to the stripper. Is that right? No, I, I oh. don't remember saying that. Oh, really. come on. <laughs> Sorry. It would have been, been a night. For the, that's for the novelists in this, and there's a lot of novelists that want to come up with things. All right, but we'll get to another question. But, but uh, I mean, does anyone believe? <laughs> do you believe that he did this on the spur of the moment? No one believes that. Who? That Ru Ruby Jack did it? Jack Ruby. Yes. You do that. All right. Yes, fair enough. I do believe that. I believe this, uh, uh, this is Sandra McElwain. Yes. Down and here in the back, there's a microphone there. Hi. Sandra McElwain from the Daily Beast. Um, having just written a piece about all of this, including, ah, yes. uh, we met the other night. Can't hear you there. Your, Turn the mic. Including uh, your book. Um, I have a terrible, I'm, Terry just said it. I have a terrible problem believing that Jack Ruby just said, okay, I'm going to get this guy because I'm a Jew. I th somebody, did, did you come across anything? Was it the mob? Was it Castro? Was it anybody um, he had been in contact with that would have, you know, incited him to this act? Uh, the honest truth is that I was never very interested in Ruby um, because I never believed that he was uh, involved with uh, with the assassination or with Oswald in any way, and that was the story that I was that I was telling. There is in the uh, Warren Commission documents, and mind you, ladies and gentlemen, there are 27 volumes that attend the report of the Warren Commission, and there is voluminous uh, focus on Ruby and any connections that he may have had. And it never comes to any conclusion that, um, you know, he was thinking about this that was anything other than a spontaneous act. So um, you, can, you can imagine that maybe it wasn't spontaneous, but this is what I've been saying to um, com conspiratorialists for the last two months. You can imagine, prove it. What's your evidence? And it is, it is a very important to me that in a 50th commemoration of uh, this, uh, this event, that the conversation is not dominated by wacky theories and imaginings of people of what might have happened. What we need to do coming out of the 50th anniversary is for serious people to focus on what we know and, and come to the conclusion that not all theories are alike. Okay? It's not like shopping at the Safeway store. You know, I think I'll buy the CIA. And maybe I'll buy LBJ. Maybe it's a Russian. Maybe it's, maybe it's Reston. It's a, they're all the same. 
you know, I started this whole process out and people said, oh no, not another therapy. <laughs> yeah. so, and, and yet the importance of Jack Ruby is, is obvious. It's not Ruby himself, it's the fact that he deprived us of learning uh, the true story from Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, sane or insane, uh, we would have learned no, so, I don't agree with that. I mean, I don't think uh, Jack Ruby would have had any, uh, any insight whatever into Lee Harvey Oswald. No, I'm not I saying that. Yeah. I'm saying he, by killing him, he, by no, killing but, Oswald, God. he deprived us of that. I uh, lots more questions, Alma, here, uh, Willie, I, <laughs> Finley. <laughs> Put the Lewis's together. Uh, Alma Gildenhorn. Um, I was, um, I remember everything of that weekend as a lot of people here do. And uh, I remember uh, watching uh, the scene of them taking him out of uh, confinement. And when Jack Ruby shot him, it was, he almost expressed the will at that time that everybody wanted to kill mm -hmm. the assassin right. who killed mm -hmm. the president. Okay. Yes. And so mm -hmm. I remember the initial reaction was, among everybody that I spoke with, good, he got him. Yeah. Uh, no one looked at um, Jack Ruby at that time or perhaps in the subsequent weeks. Um, they sort of looked at him as a hero. They might not have said it, but that's how they felt about him, that he, thank goodness, the man who killed the president was shot. So, so I mean, as somebody it, who administered punishment, yes. in effect. And then, of, then of course, saw the other theories have arisen and uh, he died uh, in prison. Yes, mm -hmm. right. But at that, when that day, it was wow. And it was very and that exciting. that very mo well have been in the psychology of Ruby himself, that he wanted to do a heroic act. Let me just say, uh, say this, that, um, that as you know, uh, well maybe you don't know as much, that, that uh, Oswald took his long walk and he encounters this police officer, and they have That's words, typical. and he shoots the police officer. Right. And then he runs to a commercial street, which is a block or two away, and starts ducking in and out of doorways. And he is noticed by a shoe store owner of this uh, bizarre behavior. Of course, the radio is crackling with, with the news of, of Dallas. And this shoe store uh, manager sees um, Oswald duck into a movie theater called the Texas Theater, uh, and um, and um, you know he goes, he gets uh, some officers. They go in, they stop the movie. It was an Audie Murphy um, war movie, and the lights come up, and they start up the aisle, and. Oswald jumps up as the police officers come into his uh, space and says, this is it, pulls out his weapon to shoot the officer, and the officer leaps at him and gets his finger in between the hammer and the bullet. Uh, they punch one another, and Oswald gets a, a, a cut and a, and, a, and a bloody eye. But uh, this is a long way around the barn to, to go back to your point, Alma, which is as uh, the, this has gotten in the neighborhood and a crowd is gathered outside the, the uh, Texas theater, and as Oswald is brought out, the throng that is there waiting for him get into a chant, kill him, kill him, kill him. So, who knows? We, we have little time left, but let's get a couple more questions in. Finley? Yeah, hi. Um, it, it's certainly one thing for the Warren Commission to fasten on to a convenient political narrative that was appropriately tragic and uh, multidimensional as opposed to simply something as, as basic as what you're suggesting. It's another thing for the news media to have gone low these uh, 50 years and not to have penetrated more closely to what you uh, see as the truth. How do you explain uh, that, uh, the, the, the performance writ large of Terry and me and Peter Range and so on? I'm annoyed at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there has Thanks, been so... <laughs> 
There's been so um, what the reporters have done with this event, particularly in relation to the conspiracies, have just keep report, reporting it. No. Uh, some people believe it's LBJ. Some people believe it's Cuba. Some people believe it's a, it's a reporting job without distinguishing between each of these theories as to whether they could have any, any credence or, or basis to them. And what we haven't seen in the analytical <coughs> press, uh, this is something I thought actually about this morning that I should have written in the last month or so, is to take up each one of these theor theories and say, OK, so you, you think it was the CIA. OK, where's the beef? OK, I happen to have run into somebody in Martha's Vineyard uh, this summer who was on a panel with Richard Helms. And Richard Helms said, we would never hire anybody like him. <laughs> OK? <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> OK, so if it's, if, it's, if it's Russia, how come they, uh, you know, how would they have accomplished this? There's, again, the press focuses on this uh, Mexico City trip that Oswald takes in late in late September, <laughs> as if that was when he was recruited by the Cubans or the, or the Russians to do this. The Dallas trip wasn't even <coughs> clear at that point, that the president was even going to Dallas, much less whether he would have a motorcade. Connolly was against the motorcade is in Dallas. Uh, where the, the talk would be, because there was this furious debate between the venues for the talk, and if the Secret Service had won out, the motorcade would have gone shot through Dealey Plaza a block away from the book depository. So there is no possible way that, that the recruitment of Lee Harvey Oswald could have taken place in September to kill the president when they didn't even know he was going to Dallas or where, where and mm -hmm. Oswald then gets hired in October at the book depository. How come? Well, it's... I, I will say in Richard Helms' defense that this book, <laughs> Uh, details, certainly for me, uh, what a marginal loser uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was. Uh, you know, and, and so I, I, <laughs> I laughed at it, but, it, but Helms has a point. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't, yes, hire, but to, you wouldn't hire him <laughs> if that's what you were trying to do. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, DeMar and Shield have with him. DeMar and Shield was a white Russian, you know. Yeah. What, oh. And very conservative. Really uh, not even uh, a moderate. Right. What? Well, the, the DeMar and Shield character is critical to the story. Uh, at least as I tell it. Uh, because he is the only witness about the politics of Lee Harvey Oswald. De Morenschild, I uh, hope you look in the book and see the picture of him, is a very elegant mm -hmm. character. Married to my cousin. Married to your cousin? Oh, we have to talk about it. Uh, so, um, and um, because the Oswalds come to Russia, they naturally fall into the Russian emigre community, which is rather small. De Morenschild's quite a figure in, in that and becomes interested. And he's quite quite taken with Lee Harvey Oswald. Here he um, is on page 29. He is quite the uh, dandy. Quite the dandy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, I think that was a very unhealthy relationship between De Morenschild and, um, and Oswald, where De Morenschild kind of toys with him intellectually. But what's really important is that um, for the 1977 House Assassinations Committee, De Morenschild sits down and he writes a narrative of his relationship with Oswald that is about 150 or 160 pages. I didn't interview uh, De Morenschild. I only read his narrative. See, um, it's very defensive. You see that? <laughs> uh, let's try to get and one more. Right, let me just make right, this one, one more final question. He, and on the day before he is, he's summoned by the House Assassinations Committee to be a witness in 1977. He's given him this, this uh, narrative. He commits suicide. Okay. Hi. I'm Bill Marmer. This may be an appropriate last uh, question. 
Uh, you, 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 uh, you say you want to distinguish your, your, yourself and your book from the conspiracy theory industry. And yeah. I'm wondering, you know, what do you think, um, how, how, how will history sort of uh, respond to, to your book as opposed to the other conspiracy theories? And, and, and do you think that you really can add a, uh, a, a footnote to the Warren Commission or a reversal of the Warren Commission? Uh, how, how, how will, do you, do you think that this is going to have legs uh, going forward in, in, in historical time? Well, I'm not the one to answer that um, <laughs> uh, question. Um, you know, I had hoped there would be some, some distinctions made in, in the walk-up to today, in the last couple of months, about what, what uh, uh, hypotheses had, um, uh, had a backing to them and which ones didn't. Um, I will say this, and this is probably uh, going to be considered confrontational in this, uh, in this mm -hmm. audience, but I was in the military for three years. Uh, I was honorably the discharged. Um, I would, um, that was a profound experience for me. I know what the value of a discharge is, and I also know what the demerit is from having a dishonorable discharge, especially someone who mm -hmm. has a limited education. It is, a, in effect, a death sentence for one's, one's employment. Whether the historians of my generation are going to pay attention to this, I can't say, but most of the uh, academics who write about this thing never had a military experience. So how can they relate to how important it is emotionally uh, and um, and so they could choose to ignore it or pay attention to it if they want, want, but somebody who's not had a military experience, I don't think, can understand the emotion behind uh, his actions. We, we've uh, basically run out of time, but uh, Finley Lewis has just handed me something here at the end suggesting that I read this first sentence uh, of a, uh, an article written on uh, Dateline Washington, November 22, by James Rustin. America wept tonight, not alone for its dead young president, but for itself. The grief was general, for somehow the worst in the nation had prevailed over the best. The indictment extended beyond the assassin, for something in the nation itself, some strain of madness and violence, had destroyed the highest symbol of law and order. I invite you to uh, thank uh, Not mine. Uh, oh. yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Good.